Okay, so um, please do feel free to jump in with any questions as we go through. Um, it's a shame we're not in a room together. It's always a bit friendlier when we can actually talk to each other, but um, hopefully the next sort of 35, 40 minutes will be really helpful. <clears throat> and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So do do um, jot down any things you wanted to mention or, or your own points and, you know, always stronger together. So it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective and view on what we uh, are going to have a look at. So I've created this session as a kind of cross phase. So this is a deep dive into reading <clears throat> and unlocking that powerhouse of possibility. I like that phrase, bit of alliteration there to remind us all what a powerful thing we hold in our hands every time we hold a book. Um, and hopefully by the end of this session, you will have found the following, um, that you, have really built on the understanding of fluency. <clears throat> so the previous session I um, I hosted for Avanti, I, when was that? Back in September, I think, we looked at reading. We did a lot around echo reading. Um, so we're going to build on that today and really look at fluency in a, in a slightly more strategic way. Uh, we're going to look at some real deep reading strategies so that when Ofsted ask you that lovely question, uh, where can we see that? You've got a whole host of ideas and strategies at your fingertips that you know uh, will evidence really great deep reading. Um, we're going to really look at those prosody and fluency skills and then deep dive into some key resources that I hope might be of use to you or have echoes in what you are already doing. And so um, affirm, reaffirm uh, what you're doing is really evidenced and, and reinforced by the research. OK. So. Fluency very much is the, br the bridge, and I think it's got a real. Um, tangibility to it that allows us to understand uh, how successfully our pupils are embedding the comprehension of what they're reading, because the fluency is what stands out as being that bridge between word recognition and comprehension. <clears throat> Apologies, I've got a bit of a cough today. Um, and it really connects our accuracy and automaticity in decoding. And it's that connection between comprehension through prosody. The minute we've got fluent expression, interpretation that shows we understand what we're reading, we've won the comprehension game. So it really is that bridge between those two aspects, word recognition and comprehension. And these are the three elements, as we know, that build and make up fluency. This is from Education Down Foundation, Improving Literacy at Key Stage 2. Um, and it's a really useful document to read um, and has all sorts in there about fluency and it being really um, tangible in its impact in the classroom. But it's that accuracy that we're looking for, reading words correctly. It's that automatic Ness, automaticity that we are just automatically reading the words without the effort. If we can get to that point, then we are building the fluency um, continuum. We're, we're moving along and it's the prosody. It's our ability to stress and have intonation and pace and pitch. It is not reading fast. It is reading with understanding because it's interesting and engaging reading because it's understanding what's being uh, what's being written, what's what the narrative is trying to convey comes across through your ability to vary your volume and your pace and your phrasing. And I think this is really interesting for us. So this um, this is in uh, some of Kilpatrick's research, but also appears in the Shot and Hall Research School work on fluency. And it's it's really key for us, isn't it, to have some things to hold on to. And for me, this is something really important to hold on to. One is that fluent readers read whole words. It's the whole word. And it's almost that the word becomes a picture, I think, in many ways, that once there is that automaticity, it's not decoding. It's a recognition of the whole word. And that's where fluency lives once we've got to that point. And Kilpatrick's research says that actually it's about one to four exposures of a written word that it begins to be instantly familiar. Um, so we will have our own uh, view on that 
and certainly many many young people I've worked with I would say that that's a much higher figure for them um, but but then maybe for others it, it's you know towards just the one or two but between one and four exposures Kilpatrick is saying allows us to become instantly familiar with a written word and then this idea about deep reading or in, other, in another phrase might be a repeated reading, allows this rehearsal, this rehearsal of text that really hones your ability to identify that instantly familiar whole word that really does build and layer our capacity for deep reading. Um, and something else that will um, perhaps be familiar with you, but uh, bears a huge amount of um, repeating because it's such a useful element to our ability to understand fluency is what Tim Rosinski's put together in his fluent reader work and that's the fluency rubric and there are several versions of this and this is one of them this is one of the more sort of um, easily grasped versions um, and for me I think this this provides a really interesting team discussion with your departments, a whole school discussion around what this looks like in particular subject areas or across particular year groups, but also with your pupils, you know, there's very much a place for this in pupil speak. This could well be something that you change uh, some of the language around to, to be useful for your year three pupils, for instance. But this allows you to, to decide where it is you sit on those different strands. So with expression and volume, with phrasing, with smoothness and with pace, which Rosinski says are the key elements of fluency um, to build and to, to sort of pitch where you are. And it can be a really great um, activity as a baseline. It can be something that you then revisit six weeks later. It can be a really lovely self-assessment tool, a peer assessment tool, something that you, you whole class assess when you're listening to somebody's speech, uh, perhaps somebody famous giving a talk on whatever it might be. But this is a really tangible element to unpicking what fluency sounds like and what it looks like. And here we've got scores of 10 or more would indicate good progress in fluency. Below 10, perhaps need a bit more additional uh, instruction, a bit more deep reading, and then come back and then revisit so that we are always able to ed evidence our success. So have a look at that. That's available in Tim Rosinski's work. Um, there are different versions of it, but that's, that's quite a nice one um, to start with. Sorry, Helen, where did you say we could access that or will we be getting these slides? I will send you. Yeah, I'll send Rebecca the PowerPoint so you'll have that. But it's part of Tim Rosinski's work. So if you were just to Google his name and fluency rubric, that, that okay. image, come, that image comes up. Thank he's you. got some he's got some great um, resources on his website and I think he's got about 10 or so different rubrics that you could use depending on the level and stage you're working with. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, um, and I don't know about you, but Matilda seems to be everywhere at the minute, and that's quite helpful for us when we're looking at reading today. Um, I think she's about to launch on Netflix, isn't she? The new the new version with um, isn't it Emma Thompson, I think, is Miss Trunchbull, which I can't wait for that bit. Um, I like the idea of Emma Thompson's Miss Trunchbull. I think it's going to go well. Um, and and this this is absolutely why, isn't it? You seem so far away, Miss Honey whispered, awestruck. Oh, I was. I was flying past the stars on silver wings, Matilda said. It was wonderful. And I had the uh, honour of being able to hear Mary Myatt's talk when she ran some training with your the Avanti Trust a few weeks ago. Um, and she was uh, very mindful of the, the place of reading. And she shared some of Willingham's research where he says that our brains privilege story. Our brains privilege story. And I think. As Matilda is trying to suggest that there is something. More than the words on the page, there's something more than the content they deliver, there's something more than the importance of. Um, getting underneath the facts on a page, there's something more about how the narrative and the story constructed enables us to visit new places, become new things, 
um, identify with new people, consider the environment and the, and the world we live in and our place within it in a way that I'm not sure anything else can quite get near. So the value of what we've just been discussing in terms of fluency is absolutely lying on the lap of Matilda here, where she says she was flying past the stars on silver wings. And those, those stories don't just have to be, you know, in book form. Those stories can come across in other ways. Um, and I think that we need to value all, sto all forms of story um, but equally, we need to know that we do have the written word alongside us. Um, things like uh, keeping the subtitles on when we're watching a film, hugely important in terms of trying to bring along perhaps our more reluctant readers, trying to embed the idea of sound and text together. The same with podcasts and audiobooks. We can follow along or we can have key elements of it um, in, in text form while we're listening. But all of those areas where story lives allow you to feel everything, know everything and live everything. And it does certainly seem that our brains privilege story in terms of capturing content and facts and our understanding about the world. So let's not forget the value of other forms of story uh, that, that may not simply be within a book. Um, because it's a really important thing that we do and we are at the moment finding that we have all sorts of barriers to leap over, perhaps particularly our boys, perhaps particularly um, at the higher end of education at A-level. I think that there is the, our students are voting with their feet. Perhaps we have not tr treated reading in the way that we should have and we have made it quite reductive. Um, in terms of simply, uh, you know, comprehension activities. Um, and we know that about 25% of our young people are moving to secondary school, really not able to meet the expected standard. So we've got a, a, a bucket full of work to do here. Um, but reading really more than any other subject um, within English gives our pupils the access to the whole of the rest of the curriculum. So it really is one of the most fundamental elements that we can encounter. So let's have a look at some deep reading strategies um, and see what we can do about that barrier, see how we can over leap it. So these are from the Shot Hall, Hall Research School um, findings um, around what really allows us to access that deep reading. And um, one of them um, here is around that real modelling of fluent reading. We're familiar with modelling writing, we're familiar with modelling talk. Modelling fluent reading perhaps is something that we have thought wasn't as important, I would say. I worked with Ofsted for about eight years um, and I'd say in all of that time I never once heard anyone model fluent reading and then ask for pupils to return that expressive reading. Um, and the value inherent within that is huge because we are then almost teacher in role. It's almost taking on that mantle of drama teacher in role, modelling that fluent reading where we're really thinking about our pitch and our intensity and our emphasis and our pausing and all those elements that build to those prosodic features that that show the link between comprehension and fluency. So that's a deep reading strategy of itself and the thought process behind that on a whole school level, you know, where am I going to see that happening? Well, it shouldn't just be in one teacher's lesson, should it? That should be all over the school in all forms of life, you know, from assembly through to uh, plenary activities through to something that happens in, in clubs around the school to something that happens um, as a sort of a high level modelling, perhaps where you've got governors or senior leaders, but where this is a shared experience that everybody values and everybody is on board. Um, and choral reading is another element of that. And there are all sorts of different forms of choral reading uh, where you might, for instance, 
ask the pupils to read along with you and then just diminish your voice so that they don't really hear you so much. It's more the pupils are beginning to uh, be heard much more. You might have different groups of pupils choral reading at one particular time, making sure everybody is participating. You want to mix that up so that it's not just a whole class activity the whole time. And it, uh, with all of these activities, it's about choosing really wisely, choosing a finite piece of text that you know has some fabulous um, potential within it. Uh, for instance, uh, pieces of text with direct speech, pieces of text with uh, lists can be quite interesting. The way you try and you know mix that up, delineate the different um, items on the list. Um, anything where you've got different voices being heard from different characters, um, but getting pupils to read collectively and as different groups and sort of bouncing that around the class is a deep reading strategy that's proven to have real impact. Um, so there you go, we've got this sort of unison, unison, unison can't speak, unison idea, it's been a long day, sorry, uh, refrain where one person reads most on their own and the rest of the group join in at a key point, repeating perhaps parts of a rhyme, cumulative choral reading where one child starts then the second is reading the second line and so on, Call and response that works really well with pieces of Shakespeare, perhaps, especially some insults. That's quite fun. Um, and then may maybe one line per child. Each child's assigned a line in the text to read when it gets to their part so that you feel th th that there's that um, inclusion for everybody around the classroom. And Rosinski talks about this being a real community builder. Great way of bringing everybody on board into that orchestra of reading. Um, and echo reading is something that I focused on last time in real detail, but I'm just going to touch on it here. But if you wanted to hear a bit more about that, then I think all, all these sessions are recorded so you could go and have another look at that if you missed it. Um, but this is where the teacher reads the section, the pupils follow and then they echo it back. So not too long, but just long enough that students can't actually rely on just memorising the text. So this is really helpful as a vehicle to all sorts of things. Memorising quotation, which is something that we have to do at GCSE level. It might be that this is something that's going to help your um, your recall and factual recall for a particular geography text, for a history text. It might be that this is a character description uh, that you need to remember. It might be that you have set this as a homework and then you play with it as an echo reading um, in the class to just really try and understand the music of the text that's being read, because that's where comprehension lives. And then deep reading, where you repeat and you repeat until there's a real level of fluency achieved. And this is very um, personal to each particular child. So it might be that that deep reading is achieved quite quickly or it might take a lot longer. But with repeated readings, there's a real evidence here to show that this word recognition automaticity really does improve the more we repeat. And it empowers our children because suddenly our kids who think they're not good at this stuff feel they can. And there's a real element of um, empowerment where there's they're, they're sort of sitting on a par with the stronger readers in the class because they've rehearsed and they've rehearsed and they can now repeat this text, this, this finite paragraph, short sentence, phrase, whatever it might be, and they can read it with that real fluency that shows comprehension. So deep reading is a really lovely activity. Um, and again, it turns on the language device, anything around um, trying to remember how something was read turns on that language device so that you hear the new patterns and you hear the, the cadence and the architecture of the writing in a way that is perhaps lost if we're trying to do a lot uh, of content as opposed to doing a little bit really well. 
And that then, of course, leads itself to one of my favourite things in education, which is all about performance. If we can then perform these pieces of reading, how much better is that? Because then there is a real audience. The moment we've got a real audience for something, then there is an inherent motivation and uh, buy in from our from our pupils. So anything that has a monologue or a dialogue or a song or a speech really well suited to performance reading. Um, and you'll find all sorts of opportunity for that within each individual curriculum area. Um, discussing text and making decisions about how it's going to be performed, that sort of metacognitive conversation is equally valuable because, of course, that's where the layers of comprehension can be unpicked. We can't say that like that because he's sad here or you can't say that bit there because you have to read that bit quite loudly because he's he's feeling upset at that point. Whatever facial expression and gesture all intrinsically linked to, to um, empower our young people to feel that they've understood and can relay narrative. Um, and then, of course, text marking. And I've got something to show you there to show how you can bring to life this piece of reading and creating your own text marks. You know, you just have a little key and empower your young people to decide what it is they're going to use as a stress marker or a pitch marker or um, a fluency marker to show where there's a pause or there's a speed or a, there's a there's a pitch change. But that, you know, working with your music departments and your musicians in the school could be something really interesting as um, as a piece of performance. So, for instance. Here's one of the world's most frightening stories. Oh, my gosh, why do we tell young children the story of Hansel and Gretel? It's terrifying, isn't it? Absolutely terrifying. So this one is just marked with the little red slashes to show us the amount of pause that's needed. And obviously that's really personal. The way somebody reads something won't be the way somebody else thinks it should be read. Uh, and there's that there's that thought process, isn't there, that um, no two people read the same book in the same way ever. We all take something different from it. So this is how I might interpret this piece. And this is a good sort of length as a guide. This is a good kind of length as a piece of uh, echo reading or choral reading. Next to a great forest, there lived a poor woodcutter with his wife and his two children. The boy's name was Hansel and the girl's name was Gretel. He had but little to eat. And once, when a great famine came to the land, he could no longer provide even their daily bread. So that's the kind of reading that I think this suits this in terms of its pause and its speed. And if we were to echo that back, if we were in a room together now, we could have good fun with this, um, then you might have different interpretations. And that in itself is a really valuable discussion. But to echo back and to deep read a piece like this, um, and particularly when it's a um, nursery rhyme or, or fairy tale like this, where there are some sort of archaic expressions or, or um, phrasings, can be really interesting to unpick together. Beware of the frightening nature of Hansel and Gretel though. And um, it's quite big in the States, this whole reader's theatre idea. Um, but I don't I don't see it very much um, in the schools I've been working with recently. But there is that real sort of collective vibe, that collective um, sort of energy behind turning books into performance where actually it is a bit about the drama. It is a bit about the theatre. It is a bit about bringing these words to life and off the page and celebrating that um, in a whole school way can really boost the kind of um, ethos and the culture of reading within a school, making it something perhaps more energetic and vibrant. Um, for young people to immerse themselves in. Because we may well have some bibliophobes out there, some people for whom reading is quite a frightening activity. Um, 
And I think that one of the answers for those pupils and for all pupils is a focus on poetry. Um, if you've seen anything I've done before, you'll know that I'm a massive advocate of poetry as a, as a vehicle to help our young people um, develop vocabulary, to immerse themselves in a word of words that feels a bit safer because the rules are off and there's a lot of white space. Um, and Jason Reynolds, who I'm sure you know, the author and now I think is the poetry ambassador or the literacy ambassador for young people in the States. Um, he talks about poetry having entire moments in just a few choice words. The spacing and the line breaks give breathability. The stanzas give you that incremental reading, a bite-sized chunk at a time, um, so that our, our ability with a poem might be more more powerful because it feels a bit safer you know uh, the mary myatt concept of high challenge low threat is met perfectly in poetry um, particularly perhaps forms like haiku particularly um visual sort of word art or poems that that echo the narrative in their structure um, but have a look at what poetry can bring to you as the text through which you deliver that deep reading that we've been talking through. And the lovely Michael Rosen has some ideas for you on this. Um, and actually this YouTube video is really fun to watch with your pupils. Um, you may well have seen it already, but if you haven't, it's worth a watch. It's about six minutes, I think. But he breaks it down into little bite sized chunks about how to perform a story. Um, and very much inherent within all of that is the concept of um, prosody and fluency and bringing things to life off the page. So that's quite fun to have a watch. Um, and in a similar way, Jason Reynolds does um, does that, but more more appropriate really for key stage, upper key stage two and key stage three. Um, any of the Jason Reynolds uh, YouTube clips where he talks about the importance of reading for young people. It's well worth a watch. And certainly it's something that you could watch and then use that fluency rubric and say, OK, Jason Reynolds, you great, amazing literacy guru. Let's have a look at how fluent we think that talk was. And you could use that to um, to uh, understand his levels of fluency. They're pretty good. <laughs> OK, so just a few um, just a few ideas and um, reading activities that might bring some some thinking to life, bring some um, fun and energy behind uh, the concept of reading and, and trying to embed reading across the school. Um, and some of these are from the lovely people at Bookmark. If you don't know about Bookmark uh, Reading Charity, then do have a look at what they're up to because they're one of our partners um, with us at Chaff Stars because we have such a synergy in our combined mission. They work with years one to four and they provide volunteers to hear children read. Um, and these are some of the activities that they use. Uh, so noughts and crosses, but using sounds is quite fun. And um, the higher up the school we go, that's something that our, our children could create themselves um, and then perhaps work with children uh, lower down the school or with different groups of children to see if they can solve the noughts and crosses boards that they've devised. But that's quite nice to use sounds for noughts and crosses. Um, some fastest finger first, where um, young people have got to find a synonym, find the word that they're being um, talked about. So finding the word quiet here. How quickly can you find a word that rhymes? How quickly can you find a word with the E sound? So that kind of turning bits, turning reading into a game, trying to um, isolate particular words, particular vocabulary. This one is about rhyme, sound and sight recognition. Um, and then there we go, there were the words. And then this one, much more to do with vocabulary, find a word that has the same meaning as pile, so looking for synonym. There it was, mound. And then this one, a phrase that means move away from each other. Can you find it on the page? There it was, scatter left and right. Um, and treasure hunts. I've seen quite a few of these. Um, sometimes 
it's it's quite nice for the pupils themselves to create the treasure hunt of the sort of things that they want to read. But if there's a kind of a, a route through the reading journey, that can really help um, so that you know, OK, I've read I've read something that gives me advice. Uh, now let's find something that makes me laugh. Now let's find something that has uh, a song or rhyme within it. Let's find something uh, from a news website. And again, things like this can me really help us to value all forms of reading. Um, I don't think it helps our children if we only value one form of reading uh, because that's not the world we live in and that's not the world that they're going to uh, encounter when they're away from our classrooms. So to bring out the value in all forms of reading like this, recipes, games, takeaway menus is of value for us when we're thinking about reading and deep reading. And then a scavenger hunt is quite fun, isn't it? When um, when we're actually reading something as a whole class, they can have a little tip list. So as you're reading with the class, reading to them, reading around the class, choral reading, whatever it might be, there's another element to the cognitive uh, picture here that you're trying to pick up on a few elements from the narrative that allows you um, a bit more insight. OK, so I'm just really looking for something that is scary, something large, something red as we're reading through. Um, and that scavenger hunt can be really well crafted to lead you on to the next element of um, your teaching sequence, whatever it might be. It might be that that scavenger hunt is something that you wanted to pull out and focus on next time. So that's a good way in um, through words or through pictures um, to hold a sort of scavenger hunt idea through the text uh, that, that's being read. Um, reading game starters. Very easy, familiar elements, I'm sure. Things like hangman for revisiting a tricky word. Um, story maps. Um, Cressida Cowell does a lot about mapping and, and the value of a, of a map to create a story. Um, and her website actually has got all sorts of resources on there that you might find useful. But a map is a great story starter. Um, and from that, you know, you can unpick the, the reading elements from her work. Um, a list of opposites um, from from a key piece of text that you might want to, to pick out some tricky words from and then maybe draw or act the, an emotion that you've been reading and focus on the expression, how to use your voice so that you are pre-armed and ready before you read this piece of text that has a real feeling of jealousy within it, whatever it might be, then you know that you've, you've pre-taught pre something of that emotion. And a mood graph is always fun. Um, I did some work recently with the schools in the Wirral and uh, we were talking about the use of Shakespeare and trying to plot how Lady Macbeth and Macbeth start and end and where there's a crossover of power and how that looks and who's happier at which point in the narrative. And you can take this kind of concept of a mood graph from the very basic version that we've got here to something much more um, in depth and quite complicated. And as a trigger for talk, a mood graph is a fabulous route into a, um, a into a reading narrative, but it, it does allow you that sort of um, conversation around, around the story, around the characters, around the emotion and the motivation. Um, that then is a great way to um, to share a story and to share the talk um, that's inherent within those ideas. And you can act it out. We've already mentioned about memorising poetry and quotes, but certainly, you know, if you if you are looking for deep reading strategies, memorising elements of poetry is really really valuable. Um, and the longer the poem, the less easy that becomes. Um, but it does stock up that language store with all sorts of patterns and rhythms and vocabulary that will really benefit um, when you're looking at trying to focus on a fluent reading.
um, concept. And here's, here's Jason Reynolds telling us about the stories we read in books are ones we can experience over and over. They serve as anchors, wings, compasses, roadmaps and magnifying glasses. And I think that in terms of deep reading and this idea of reading something over and over to build the fluency within it, not only does it do that, but it also reinforces this idea that these words and these these ideas that we surround ourselves with can pr provide us with wings. They can provide us with a roadmap. They can provide us with a magnifying glass. You know, it's certainly true that we are now much more mindful that our young people need to see something of themselves in the books that they're reading. And to that end, this is what we want those books to do. We want them to magnify certain elements of life. We want them to provide roadmaps. We want them to be a compass to guide and wings to soar and be amazing in, in their chosen uh, path. So yes, it's about deep reading. Yes, it's about understanding how we build fluency. But one of the most vital elements of the reason we do that is provided here beautifully eloquently by Jason Reynolds. So my my challenge to all of us is what's our marmalade sandwich? What is it that's our marmalade sandwich that we keep in our hat in case of an emergency? What is the marmalade sandwich um, that will allow us to bring our young people into a world of words where they feel successful, where they can unpick and immerse themselves in words confidently and with, a, with their self-esteem boosted in a way that perhaps wasn't so before. Um, because that fluency is about that whole word recognition. And the minute we leap to that, remember it was between one and four times they need to encounter it. The minute we are in, into that and we have repeated and rehearsed, then we've got that opportunity to feel the success and the empowerment that that provides. So we need those marmalade sandwiches under our hats to make sure that every one of our class, every one of our different members of our um, different groups, disadvantaged groups, boys, high achievers, everybody has the ability to feel powerful and empowered by the words that they read. So thank you Paddington. As a, as a visual aid memoir, perhaps the metaphorical marmalade sandwich is what we all need to hang on to. Um, and before I finish, just to remind you that this report that I was delighted to contribute to has got some fabulous case studies. So there are nine case studies in this uh, reports and whilst ostensibly it is about closing the word gap, obviously inherent within that there is a lot about reading in this report and what different schools are doing about um, closing the word gap through their reading activities. So there's all sorts um, across the nation um, here from for case studies from Plymouth up to Scotland and I think you'll find something useful in there. There's primary schools, there's secondary schools, um, some of the transition activities that they talk about here are really exciting around the use of the family tree um, and some more sort of dramatic interpretations, ideas for assemblies. So do have a look um, and see if there's anything in there that would be helpful or supportive. Um, there is a range of books for, called Boost Your Vocabulary that I happen to know are rather good and useful. Um, and this podcast series, there was a couple on here really particularly about reading and echo reading. Um, and there are two podcasts there that feature with Michael Morpurgo. And he talks about um, what we can do to create the world of words for our pupils. So have a listen to some of those. They're really helpful. There's a YouTube channel here that we, I run. Um, and on there you'll find uh, all the Bookmark and Chatterstars collaborative webinars that we've just been running. So have a look at those because there's lots there around reading that might be of use to you. Um, and of course, our Chatterstars app is there to support you um, if you feel that that would help. And let's give the last word to Matilda. 
it sort of personifies what we've been talking about, I think, quite well. So Matilda's strong young mind continued to grow, nurtured by the voices of all those authors who had sent their books out into the world like ships on the sea. These books gave Matilda a hopeful and comforting message. You are not alone. So thank you for joining me. Uh, if you're on Twitter, then uh, let's stay in touch. Um, if I stop the share now, then hopefully we can have a few questions uh, together. We've got about 10, 10 minutes or so. So if there's any questions anyone would like to jump in with, then fire away. Hi, Sarah, I can see you. I can't hear you though. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, talk about talk about stereotyped issues there. Um, I do have a little question. And yeah, I'm probably missing the point here, but you know, I'm trying to avoid saying it's probably a stupid question, but it probably is. Um, There's no such thing as a stupid question. <laughs> so you were talking about um, at one point about as you're reading or as the class is reading, having a checklist to identify things. Um, Yes, when they came up in the text, tick off something scary. Oh, something the, the scavenger hunt. The scavenger hunt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and it just slightly put a question mark in my head because last week I was um, on some CPD where there was a lot of talk around the problem of split attention. And if you're trying to focus on two things at once and you're not focusing on either of them properly and so on and so forth. And I mean, I know that's sort of to be dealt with with caution because some kids do really well with a fidget toy and other kids you know need to be in a dark in, in you know yeah, so i know yeah. that it's it's all on a scale but i was just wondering how the scavenger hunt works with the whole split attention problem Do, you know does it work yeah it's a really valid point yeah and i'm i've certainly taught pupils for whom that would really not work um but it might it might be an an additional layer to the narrative that you're trying to bring out. So, for example, let's say you're looking at the Gothic genre and you want the children to be really mindful that they they are looking for the connotation of the Gothic genre. So they were picking out, you know, a scary house, a dark, windy night, anything that picks those that suits that genre. So you might have a little tick list there that they could tick or it might just be as simple as you've got the list on the board or you've put it, you know, on the desk or something, and they've just got to put their hand up when they, they think they've spotted something from that genre. I think I think scavenger hunts work quite well when you're trying to look at genre, perhaps less well if you've got uh, struggling readers who, for whom it's the most important thing is that they really follow, follow the narrative. So, yeah, you know, like all these so things... It, it it's going to depend, isn't it, on the stage of reading for individuals, but also in terms of where you are with the class. I can see, you know, if you've read the narrative, if you're familiar, if you're doing the deep read, then yes. and, you're, and you're pulling thing, points out, targeted yeah. points, not just a yeah. sort of scattergun scavenger, scavenger yeah. approach. Yeah, yeah. And it's quite a nice um, task to check everyone's really listening as well. You know, mm -hmm. maybe you're doing some reading at the end of the day or you start every lesson with a 10 minute read. You might just have three things that they're, they're listening for. And, and and sort of phrase it like that. It doesn't have to be a called a scavenger hunt, you know, call it what you will. But just the concept that we are listening out for these three things in particular, you know. Yes, thank you. Might, might be helpful. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Do jump in, unmute and, and unmask. <laughs> I think you're all sitting there drinking your cups of tea and dunking your biscuits. <laughs> Sarah's back. OK, well, if there aren't any other questions. Then. I'm happy to call it to a close, but very happy for you to jump in with a few more questions if you'd like, or in the chat box if you would rather. 
be nice to hear what you do, what you what you feel works. Any little marmalade sandwiches you keep under your hats that you know work really well. Someone just cropped up in the chat. Yeah. One question, brilliant. Question coming. How could we incorporate techniques into other subjects, especially RE? Um, great question. I think uh, there are huge, you know, with every with every subject area, you have your own subject specialist um, language and your own subject specialist um, content that you want to highlight in any given session. Um, and activities like uh, scavenger hunt we've just been talking about, but certainly those deep reading strategies about rehearsing um, for meaning can be really helpful. The echo reading concept um, can really support that understanding about, you know, maybe it's key dates. Maybe you want to add drama um, to a piece of writing, but it's certainly true that, you know, our brains privilege story. So within any subject area, if you are reading texts that have created a narrative around the fact that you're trying to um, teach, then our brains will privilege that. That is how we understand and get on board and hold on to the concepts that we're trying to teach and deliver. Um, so I know with um, history, for example, historical fiction can be hugely powerful in helping young people understand, you know, the Great Fire of London, to understand um, World War II, whatever it might be, because we on a human level really can identify. And the minute you've got that narrative writing, <laughs> all of those deep learning, strat uh, deep reading strategies are really um, important to bring out the comprehension of what it is that they're reading. So I think um, pretty much everything we've talked about, you can translate into your own subject area. Um, my subject is English, as you know, so that probably comes across as the main content that I refer to. But given that we want to privilege story, that can be delivered through all um, subject areas. So hopefully that will be helpful. And there is certainly, you know, I'm sure you, that you're already using lots of um, narrative texts to deliver the RE curriculum. Hope that helps. Zoe, are you, have you got a question for us? Don't know. I can see the three little dots like you're writing something for us, Zoe, but yes, you are. Brilliant. Um, OK, oh, that's a great question. Considering starting a weekly reading lesson. Excellent. Yes, do it, do it. Uh, would you suggest using a reading program? Um, well, I don't know your context, so that's um, quite tricky. I. I can give you my personal opinion, which is regarding Accelerated Reader, um, that I think it has some value. My biggest worry with it is that we tell kids what they can and can't read. And by doing so, we might well squash some of their natural curiosity and interest and motivation to read a book that they have chosen. So that's a bit of a I'm always a little bit nervous about that with Accelerated Reader. But that said, I know that some schools do find it has some success for them. Um, I would say 
if you are starting a weekly reading lesson, what, what year are you working with Zoe? Here she is. Hi, Zoe. Hi. Um, so, yes, yeah, so year seven and eight. Yeah. So um, I would, there's a lot of evidence coming through quite recently to say that reading something that is more challenging than we think those young people can cope with has huge impact. Um, particularly when you are really modelling that fluent reading carefully and doing a little bit of choral reading or a bit of echo reading along the way. Not loads, you know, it's you don't want to kill the story, but you do want to have those little key moments, perhaps when there's a lovely piece of direct speech, perhaps when there's a little monologue uh, where you can do the, some of those deep reading strategies. But um, I would see who you've got in front of you. Don't necessarily give them the choice because they won't know what they're choosing, but do have a think about then their interests, you know, your context as a school, what's what's local to your community. Those sorts of elements will help you choose books, but I would just go for it. Thank you. you know. Yeah, well, obviously we're reading all the time in English lessons and um, discussing the novel and doing various activities, but I, I'm just wondering about, you know, literally just reading without any writing alongside it for once a yeah. week. Yeah, absolutely do it. And don't feel worried about doing that. We know we're, we've beaten ourselves up for so many years in education about not having evidence for having done work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and actually, what what is there that's more valuable? I would say choose some poetry alongside all of that as well. Hmm. Um, you know, you can have, you know, collected poetry, couldn't you? But uh, to share poetry regularly that's of a high level, just be so, so brilliant. You, they would learn so much. And it, and there's a catalyst for talk, you know, it's just, it's couldn't be better, really. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.